Welcome to Saks Realty's Tuesday Night Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything real estate. Each week, we deliver expert information, enabling you to make better informed decisions while keeping more money in your pocket. If you're interested in real estate, this is your show. Hey guys, thanks for joining tonight. You're about to hear an interview that I had with Dr. Lawrence Yoon of the National Association of Realtors. He's the chief economist. We're talking about all the issues that are happening right now and the hot topic of real estate. You know, real estate's kind of like the weather and the stock market. You know, whether it's up or down, everybody wants to talk about it all the time. It's a big, important part of our life. It's our housing. I hope you enjoy this interview. Dr. Yoon, thank you so much for joining me. It is an honor. You must be a very busy man right now. Uh, well, it's very uh, interesting times. Uh, so thank you, Todd, for having me. Could you just uh, give everybody like an overview? Uh, obviously, the National Association of Realtors is a big part, you know, as in our life, you know, being in the industry as a real estate broker and a real estate agent. Um, but a lot of people don't really know what you do. We see you in the news a lot right now uh, because of everything that's going on. But can you just kind of give everybody um, an overview what you do as a chief economist and also, um, you know, how important the role of the National Association of Realtors really is in our housing market? Uh, well, uh, you know, there are uh, over 1.5 million realtor members across the country, uh, essentially at every corner, every community. Uh, and uh, many uh, elected officials, uh, whether it is a mayor, city uh, commissioner, uh, or say uh, members of Congress, uh, if they want to know what's going on in their community, uh, you know, what, who are moving in or why are people moving out, uh, they want to talk with the realtors. Uh, and furthermore, uh, given that realtors' clients have purchased properties, uh, realtors are representing the property owners to assure that private property rights are well represented uh, at all levels of government. Uh, so to assure that real estate is a very important component of the economy, uh, and a very solid foundation for development of the community. So we want to relay this message. My role is specifically as a chief economist. Uh, I'm a numbers guy, just love the numbers. So naturally, uh, looking at the MLSs across the country, how many home sales, what is the prices doing, uh, inventory, wow, inventory shortage that we have experienced past uh, couple of years. All this message needs to be out there uh, to emphasize we have housing shortage. Uh, so to address uh, some policies, you know, maybe we need to build more home. Uh, is there excessive zoning and regulation that prevents that? Uh, and the other area is just about uh, the overall uh, inclusive nature of the wealth building that comes with home ownership. You know, home ownership rate among a different ethnicity, racial category. Well, there is difference, and we want to see what the reasoning for that, uh, and to see what to how to address better so that more Americans would have opportunity to build wealth through ownership of properties. Yeah, you know, we definitely need more affordable housing. That's for sure. I mean, we've watched the divide, you know, over the last several years. Uh, become more and more. And in fact, you know, you talk about uh, building and developing. There's so much red tape in America, uh, you know, with uh, builders being able to build affordable housing. It's so expensive. And um, I remember not too long ago, I had a conversation with Dr. Carson when, you know, he was in HUD. And that was one of the first things he said. He said, you know, we really need to address this because we need affordable housing. And, you know, the crazy thing about it is everybody agrees, but, you know, on a political level, they just don't want it in their neighborhood, you know? So it's crazy on what we see, you know, uh, you know, working in the, the, the trenches every single day. But, you know, so some of the big things in the news right now, uh, interest rates, I mean, we have been at historic lows and um, we track it, you know, obviously our livelihood depends on home sales. So people buying and selling. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy, you know, whether the Fed should have done this last year, uh, you know, kind of slowed things down. Who knows? It didn't happen, but now we're seeing it. So, you know, just last week, the Fed said they were going to try a soft landing, right? Pump the 
breaks a little bit and sort of increase 50 basis points and leave on the table the potential to do it again. And of course, you know, a lot of people think that the Fed raising the interest rate directly affects mortgages. And we know that that's not correct. It's not exactly right, though it does seem that when the Fed raises interest rates that, you know, interest rates do go up. Can you just kind of explain what some of the reasons are for the mortgage rate itself going up um, and how, uh, I guess, investors sort of like with, because everybody hears these mortgage-backed securities and they don't really understand it and what it really means on an investor level, people buying the mortgages on secondary markets. Can you just kind of shed some light to that? Oh, uh, you know, uh, we look back towards March 2020, uh, and I specifically remember uh, the month uh, because I was looking forward to the March madness, but uh, the ugly COVID came to the country and we had a lockdown. Uh, it's very scary times, uncertainty about the nature of the virus. You know, you touch a doorknob and accidentally touch your face. Uh, is that a death sentence? You know, we really do not know about the nature. And also the economic shutdown. We lost 20 million jobs during the single month. I mean, massive job losses. Therefore, the Federal Reserve essentially said, we are going all in, absolutely low interest rate policy. So they wanted to move it that way. They moved the short-term interest rate to essentially zero. They did something called the quantitative easing. Uh, what it means is that uh, when the mortgages are originated, so your clients you know, get a mortgage, buy a home, well, that mortgage generally is sold to Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie, in turn, needs to sell someplace, you know, whether to Wall Street or others. Uh, it just provides the liquidity. Uh, what the Federal Reserve did was they said, Fannie and Freddie, sell it to us. Uh, that way, we can keep the mortgage rates at the lowest possible uh, range. And mortgage rate actually dipped under 3%. These are historic lows. People have not seen it. And consequently, one of the surprise of the coming out of the lockdown when the economy reopened was home sales boom, low interest rates. People are just amazed at how much purchasing power they had. So in a sense, people can say, well, 2020, 2021, those two years were the historically low interest rate environment of 3% in essence. Now mortgage rates are at 5% or above 5%. And this is from very small moves by the Federal Reserve. As you referred, Todd, Fed raised the interest rate by 50 basis point, meaning half a percentage point. Yet mortgage rate have risen much more. And the reasoning for that is in essence that the mortgage rate is already anticipating the Fed is not done. Fed will do multiple rounds of rate increases and tries to price that information. So the way I view it is, People who got 3% mortgage rates or refinance into 3%, congratulations, you got the historically bonus interest rates. Today, 5% interest rate, you, know, you step back, take a deep breather and say, wow, this is not bad at all. I mean, when I purchased my first home, mortgage rates were 8%. When my parents purchased their home, mortgage rates were 15%. Of course, we have chance to refinance it uh, downward as the mortgage rate changes. Uh, but uh, the high mortgage rate uh, certainly uh, is a big change from what it had been. But still, historically, it is favorable. Yeah, we just uh, actually recorded a video <clears throat> explaining about, um, you know, the last 30 years. I mean, it was much higher. I mean, we hovered right around six and a half, seven percent. I mean, really, with some spikes and some dips. And yeah, I remember when I first bought my house, it too, I think was seven and a half or eight percent. Um, you know, I, I know that there's nobody has a crystal ball, but if you had to give your best educated guess, I mean, what do you think we're going to see in the next 12 months with mortgage rates? Uh, I think the big change in mortgage rates have already occurred. It will depend upon how aggressive the Fed needs to be to contain inflation. 
So in a sense, the wild card is really about consumer price inflation, which is running at 40 year high, is topping 8% from one year ago, uh, and it refused to budge downwards. So rather than being transitory, it appears to be more semi-permanent uh, high inflation. We know when we go to the gas station, uh, it's maddening. You know, go to grocery store, or you know, where's uh, uh, the, the pocketbooks are being empty. Uh, so uh, it's frustrating on the high inflation. In fact, inflation rate uh, is running faster than people's wage growth. So in a sense, our standard of living uh, is falling somewhat. Uh, so it all depends on the direction of the inflation. If somehow inflation tops out and begins to steadily decelerate, meaning that say it goes from 8% to 6%, then the Fed may say, well, we don't have to be so aggressive. And then we may actually see the mortgage rate possibly coming down, uh, even to say even slightly below 5%. But at the moment, uh, my best guess is that by December of this year, mortgage rate will be averaging about 55 to 5.8%. You know, I, I heard the briefing when the Fed was talking about, you know, right after they decided to raise the 50 basis points and they kind of, you know, uh, talked about it. And then basically what they did was took questions, right, and gave some answers. And uh, the most, I think, concerning uh, of what I heard was when they, you know, basically said about the, I think it was 11 million jobs that were needed here in the U.S. and that they were hoping to slow down the economy so we didn't need those jobs. And the way I kind of, as a business owner, kind of took that was them saying, we're going to reduce the amount of business that you're doing because, you know, right now you need people and we're going to try and make it so that you don't need these extra people. And, you know, whether that is their intention or not, you know, as a business owner, I always think, oh, geez, you know, here the government's coming to say I'm here to help. And, you know, uh, will it be a soft landing? Will it be a crash landing? I mean, we're all sitting on the sidelines together. But I guess, you know, if you could just help us understand when the Fed talks about lowering the inflation, the rate of inflation to more of that. 2% number. And when you're looking at where we are now, you know, we're mentioning six and 8% and inflation that's highest in 50 years, 40, 50 years. How does raising the rate, how is that mechanism supposed to work? And then what are the chances that it will, and what would have to happen to get it to 2%? To me, that sounds like a recession. Um, so we had a massive stimulus, as you know, you know, people received some business loans, which were canceled, you know, PPP loans, uh, many uh, individuals uh, received stimulus uh, checks. Uh, and one compares US with other countries, say developed countries in Japan, Australia, European countries, America did more. Consequently, America is facing higher inflation. So I think one uh, lesson from this is to say, there is no free lunch. Just because you are pumping more money into the economy when things were uncertain, and again, it was highly uncertain period, does not mean it's gonna be automatically free lunch. So we are finding that uh, the cause of that is we are getting higher inflation. And way to contain higher inflation is to raise interest rate to slow some of the economic activity. Uh, because persistent high inflation is where things become so uh, uncertain. I mean, one can look at so, you know Mexico, Venezuela, where they consistently run high inflation, uh, Turkey. Uh, then the entrepreneurs say, no, this is an environment where things are not under control. So you want to say you are under control by getting inflation to about 2%, you know, ideal uh, inflation rate. So housing market will come down as a result of this. When I said we will come down, meaning that home sales will be measurably lower this year. Now prices, I don't think it will fall just because we have this persistent housing shortage. It's gonna take multiple years to address this housing shortage. So I don't think prices will necessarily fall in a broad level. So whether at the national level or say regional, mid-Atlantic region, prices will not decline. 
But certainly in certain neighborhood, one may begin to see some uh, price of reduction, uh, which is the reason why you know, one has to work with professional realtors to assess how to price it. You misprice it based on the market LinkedIn's and somehow people uh, taint the home as something unknown, undesirable, and you don't want to have that label. So housing market would be one area where you will see some slowdown in sales and even some new home construction. The other area is business borrowing. You see the reaction in the stock market. As interest rate rise, stock market corrects and is hurting 401k retirement fund for people. They will have to spend less into the economy. Uh, there is a lack of uh, consumer confidence and business borrowing costs is rising. Uh, and even say commercial real estate developers, you know, when they buy, there's a terminology called cap rates. Essentially, they buy the building, how much rent surge is being generated, and they say, well, you know, I get about 6% return. But most of the financing of commercial real estate is through short-term interest rates. So when interest rate rise, they have to refinance uh, one year from now. And when they refinance, they realize that the cap rates or the rate of return, 6%, is not that much compared to the cost of borrowing and has it will slow down commercial real estate uh, transactions as well. So raising interest rate in a sense is to say, well, we had this free lunch in a sense, massive stimulus. Uh, maybe we did too much. Now we're going to have to take it away. That's going to slow the economy. Let's hope that it's a soft landing and not a hard crash landing where we have, uh, say, uh, large job losses across the country. You know, when you mention houses or I guess a slowdown in sales and, you know, I think about the new home builders, it looks like that they are, you know, dropping prices on homes that uh, will be delivered in, you know, three or four months from now. And, um, you know, the concerns, I guess, that I have with all of this is and exactly what you're saying with your know, short term financing and higher interest rates for our businesses. You know, a lot of this inventory they are borrowing on, right? And you get these, uh, you know, uh, wholesalers that are warehousing, just say building materials. And, you know, we just looked at a report from the USDOT where it said that they we've experienced at our ports the highest or the, the, the busiest January than we have in, you know, history. And that they're showing that at a 6% higher than pre-pandemic level, um, they're shipping, there's more shipping to these suppliers, you know, being, I guess, you know, they experienced COVID and the shutdown and then they ran out. And I guess a lot of these businesses are just saying, you know what, we don't want to run out anymore. And I don't think a lot of the business owners track enough of what's going on because they're running a business. And then all of a sudden it slows down and they go, oh no. You know, where's all the business? I mean, I know a couple suppliers, wholesale suppliers that are concerned right now. And they're already starting to look at, you know, not needing the extra welder or the extra yard person and things like that. I mean, you've seen this before. I mean, you're you're an economist. I mean, this is your business. Um, you look at a lot of the history, you see what is going on in other countries. Um, we have had such a strong run since the crisis of 08, uh, really a decade strong run. We've seen more cash in the, in the markets. You know, the government has even said, hey, more people have money in the banks than really we've seen before. Um, doesn't mean that they want to get up off of it and spend it uh, and get rid of their cushions. But do you think that we are going to see unemployment rates rise as a result of bringing, you know, the attempt to bring down the inflation? If we have a recession, and for ordinary Americans, they would explain recession as when their neighbors lost a job. Uh, so, you know, they see the economic slowdown. Now, when they lose their job, personal job, they said this is an economic depression. So, you know, this is how ordinary Americans would uh, explain the economic cycle. The economists explained uh, by something called GDP reduction for two straight quarters. I think people have some idea of GDP, the broad size of the economy, economic production. Uh, and if it declines two straight quarters, 
And it already declined in the first quarter. So people will be awaiting in the second quarter uh, to see whether or not we would have economic recession. So technically, we may have economic recession, but it would be the most unique economic recession of all time in a sense that we have a massive labor shortage. There's about 10 million job openings, help one assigned. People can walk the, the streets, see on the restaurants, you know, needing cashiers, but at the construction site as well. I know there's some uncertainty among home builders. They are taking a little caution, but they still uh, need some workers or they didn't have sufficient number of workers to complete the job. Uh, so we have a large job openings and not enough people searching for those jobs, people who are technically unemployed. So these are not people just sitting at home. They have to actually search for job, and that's how they become statistically as being unemployed. If you are not searching for job, you are out of the labor force. That don't even count you as statistics. So one has to be searching for job. And people searching for job is around 6 million. So you have 10 million job openings, 6 million people looking for job. So even if we were to have technical economic recession, I don't think the job market will suffer all that much because you know job openings may begin to decline from say 10 million to 8 million or 7 million. But right now there's only about 6 million Americans searching for job. Do you think there will be any repercussions on the amount of uh, pay growth? And I, there may be some people that are sitting watching this right now or listening and they're, they may say, what are you talking about? You know, like I haven't seen a big hike in pay or, uh, but what we noticed, especially in the construction industry was that um, the labor rates really went high. And, you know, and I, and I guess I've seen it more in the, the white collar sector as well, where you had so many people recruiting you know, uh, giving recruiting bonuses or retention bonuses or things like that because the economy was booming so much. Do you think that employers, and I know this is purely speculation, but on these 6 million people that are looking for jobs, as we start to see a slowdown, do you think that employers will be trying to replace the higher priced employees with a more economical, you know, option? Well, you know, as a business owner, um, uh, they should always be looking for cost savings, how to maximize profit, and then profit in turn leads to more business creation and competition. And through the competition, one essentially say, oh, this is the market wage, this is the market price. So that's how things would work out. Right now, the average wage growth in America is about five and a half percent. So if one wants to hire a secretary or you know some uh, help uh, in certain area, one would need to pay five and a half percent more, which is much higher than what people were accustomed to, two or three percent in the wage increases. Um, but uh, from the people who are trying to find a job, they said, well, even with five percent higher wage, inflation is eight percent. So essentially, whatever additional that I get is being wiped away by higher inflation. So that disincentivize uh, the people wanting to uh, look for work. So we are in a very unique situation. So uh, one is, well, the wage growth, I think, will be around 5.5% for next couple of years. But the consumer prices, let's hope Jerome Powell from the Federal Reserve is correct, that it will steadily decelerate. So it goes down to 6%, 4%, and maybe in... Uh, two, three years, it goes back to a historical normal of 2%. So people really do feel that their wages are now higher than inflation. Um, but uh, the we have a labor shortage at the moment. And, and that's why, you know, trying to find those construction workers, truck drivers. Wow, you know, I'm hearing that in some places they are trying to offer a six-figure salary for experienced truck drivers because they don't have enough truck drivers. So uh, very uh, interesting dynamics at the moment. Absolutely. You know, there was a um, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas report that I just like to touch on um, because, you know, I've been serving the housing industry for, I think this is my 33rd year coming up. I started in 1989 swinging a hammer as a contractor and have served this industry, the housing market, in one way or another ever since. I can't 
seem to think I, I do remember from 97 to 2005, we had an amazing run and the, the uh, headlines of the Baltimore sun paper and uh, in 2005 said the overpriced Baltimore market. And we instantly saw its effect. You know, a lot of people, agents, they say, well, we had the housing crisis of 08. But for me, it really started in 2005 because I watched the major price dips start to happen, right? And people are like, oh, prices are never going to go down. They're never going to go down. And, and, uh, and I experienced that. And by 08, it was a bloodbath, right? If you were in the business and you told people you were a real estate agent, they said, what else do you do, right? Because chances are you weren't making a great living at it. But this article on uh, March 29th that was published, uh, they had a model and they had a, a lot of great authors, economists that uh, compiled this data. And um, it was on the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas's website. And um, they had used this modeling uh, that showed that starting in the last five quarters, really leading up to the end of 21, that the model showed that there was an exuberance, you know, an excitement that helped to drive the prices. Now, you and I know that it came from many different you know, places, how the shortage of inventory, Wall Street, buying houses, you know, from the program that the federal government put in place, you know, after the crisis of 08. Um, but then really the pandemic, the labor shortage, the shortages of supply at low interest rates, it was a perfect storm. We have seen some of the biggest hikes in prices, year over year prices than we've ever seen. When you say uh, that you don't see the prices coming down, um, you know, I look at it as kind of like two different things, right? I look at a price coming down would be a buyer not needing to put 50000 over appraised value in cash to actually get a house. Do you believe that exuberance or just an excitement or like a fear of missing out from the buyers, this almost like an auction mentality, help to drive these prices up to where they are right now? And do you think that any markets in the U.S., the ones that have really climbed, do you think any of them will see a downturn in pricing? Uh, well, you know, first, uh, I salute to you regarding your first uh, coming out as a contractor because, you know, when we look at the U.S. economy, our prior topic about the labor shortage and so forth, uh, too many people are going to college and they are there saying, I need some office employment. And I like to see more people, uh, you know, swinging the hammer or getting the welders uh, apart. Uh, and then uh, later, you know, go, go get the college education uh, because it should not be like one or the other. It could be both, you know, because that was one way to reduce the student debt uh, by having earning some good uh, the, uh, money, just doing the uh, sweat equity portion. But that aside, your question is very important uh, because America experienced the terrible foreclosure crisis of 2008, 2010. For the people in the industry, of course, it was a very tough business environment. You know, home sales have been reduced by 40% from the peak years, home prices collapsing. Uh, and for the homeowners, I mean, they saw their wealth just dissipate uh, from the foreclosure crisis. And of course, we saw millions of families actually lose their home, uh, which is quite a traumatic experience. So we don't want to have her have that repeat situation. And for consumers to ask, are we in another bubble? Those are very valid questions. Federal Reserve in Dallas, as you referred to, did some analysis. And by all metrics, you know, price to rent ratio, price to income ratio, all the factories implying, well, things are a little bit out of whack. But at the same time, we have to say, was it caused by loose underwriting standards as happened in 2000? And five, uh, before the foreclosure crisis, essentially giving mortgages to people who are really uh, not qualified, uh, even uh, doing uh, the negative amortization. That is to say, 
your mortgage payment will be less than the interest on the loan so that with each passing month, your loan balance actually rises. I mean, these are terrible mortgages uh, and not checking people's income, uh, all that part. Fortunately, this round, when the housing market is solid, uh, I should say strong, it was driven by people who are all cash, who have zero chance of foreclosures, and by people who are taking out a mortgage who had to meet these stringent underwriting conditions. Now, of course, the appraisal value did not come with the market price, so people had to come up with additional cash, but they found additional cash you know, from the bank and others. So it's all their equity, their money in, into the home purchase. So in that sense, it's less risky. The second major difference is that back in 05, 2005, preceding the foreclosure crisis, home builders went wild. Normally, America would see about one and a half million new home construction each year. Single family, multifamily, like apartment buildings, about one and a half million. Builders were putting up over two million for a couple of straight years. So this was way oversupply. So we had a condition of loose lending oversupply. This round, we have a strong demand, but strong credit quality. And the builders have been underproducing, not for one year, but for 10 straight years. So the cumulative effect of underproduction is we have record low inventory condition. Uh, so it's a little different uh, this round. So of course, you know, prices could decline. When I see like markets like Phoenix, pricing went up. 30% in 12 months, 30%. So if it declines 5%, is it a big deal? I'll probably say, well, you know, 30% and 35%, probably not. So, but is that a crash? I'm not sure if it's a crash. It's just somehow this, you know, uh, anytime you have a huge run up in a number, a figure, uh, maybe there's a slight decline, but I don't think it's anything worrisome. Now I would have some concern about very expensive markets like San Francisco and New York especially in light of this work from home flexibility. So to the degree that office workers do not have to go to office five days a week means that people may want to buy home in deep out in the second ring, third ring suburbs. So people who are uh, uh, not necessarily near a metro city, but still could drive say one and a half hour commute uh, people may say, well, if I only need to commute two days a week, I don't mind. I'd rather have a large home, peaceful life out in the next county. Uh, and hence, I may say there could be some price reduction in expensive cities like San Francisco or New York from this work from home uh, trend that's developing. All great information. We're so glad we had you uh, to kind of fill us in on what's going on and and. Dr. Yoon, thank you so much. We hope to have you back or at least leave the door open to have you back again. Well, thank you, uh, Todd, for you know, very great conversation. You raised very interesting questions, so I really enjoyed it. Well, you have a great night and we'll talk to you soon. Great, thank you. Thanks for watching that interview with Dr. Yoon. If you liked it, if you hit the thumbs up, it'll let Dr. Yoon and myself know that you did. And guys, we always appreciate you subscribing, hitting the alert bell, and that will make sure that you don't miss any of our content that we upload. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week.